Hi, everybody. I'm Michael Luo. I'm the editor of NewYorker.com. I'm really excited to bring you this conversation today about the fight for local news. I thought I'd start our panel um, with some data points to frame our conversation. And these numbers are uh, familiar, I think, to uh, the folks on the panel, but I think they'd be useful to to uh, start our conversation. Um, according to a report that was published last year by the University of North Carolina in the past 15 years, more than a quarter of the country's newspapers have disappeared. That's 2,100 newspapers. The death of those outlets has left at least 1,800 communities that had a local newspaper without one in 2020. The number of local journalists in the country has been cut in half in that time. And COVID has only accelerated this trend. At least 30 new newspapers closed in April and May 2020 as cases surged around the country and thousands more journalists uh, lost their jobs or were furloughed. Um, the New Yorker, where I work, uh, published a deep, uh, deeply reported piece by uh, one of our writers, Charles Bethay, about Jones County in Eastern North Carolina, which no longer has a newspaper. There used to be a weekly that served this county. It no long, it, it's no longer uh, really a newspaper. Um, it's faded to the point that uh, you might call it a ghost newspaper, which is another phenomenon that is happening across the country. Places that have been so cut back that they're not really producing anything substantial anymore. Um, obviously, in North Carolina, there used to be a great newspaper, still a very great newspaper, the Raleigh News, News and Observer that used to have 250 newsroom employees. Now it's around 60. And Charles writes about this auto shop where the residents of Pollocksville in North Carolina, one of three small towns in this county, now go to shoot the breeze and kibbutz and, and get their news. It's a, it's a fascinating uh, thing. Um, I'm just really excited to have uh, these folks here uh, with us. Um, I was thinking before this call, it'd be really fun for the four of us to uh, to get together and start a local newspaper together. It, I think we'd have a real shot at uh, doing some good. Um, I'll do brief introductions. We have Zahira Torres, a senior editor, editor for an investigative reporting initiative uh, by ProPublica and the Texas Tribune. Mandy Jenkins from the Compass Experiment, a local news laboratory founded by McClatchy and Google to explore sustainable business models for local news. And Sewell Chan, my uh, friend from college and the editorial page editor for the Los Angeles Times. Um, each of you is very much in the fight right now for local news. You're, you're on the ground, you're in the heat of the battle. I thought a good way to start was to ask each of you to talk about the specific local news problem that you're involved in, that you're working on. So we could give folks a, a more of a texture of the nature of the problem in different parts of the country. Um, Zahira, just to surprise you and, and start with you, maybe we can uh, start with you because I understand you're in transit right now and starting a brand new job, which is taking you home to Texas, where you were also the editor of a small newspaper in your hometown, the El Paso Times. What is the state of local news in Texas and how does this project that you're now working on fit in? Yeah, I think it's uh, varied, right? I think, you know, you mentioned, Michael, which I think is important. You said, you know, we're in the battle of local news. And I think all of us should feel like we're in the battle of local news. Um, the challenge is that that battle is very varied. Um, so, you know, I ran the newsroom in El Paso, Texas, which is my hometown. Uh, it is a county of more than 800,000, uh, was once a very a uh, substantive newsroom um, and had about a hundred folks on staff, you know. Um, the newsroom now has dwindled to fewer than 20 uh, and that includes editors and, you know, sports reporters and photographers and everything else for a county of 800,000. Um, and so El Paso is fighting one battle, right? Like El Paso is trying to figure out how do you uh, after for years following a model that focused on advertising, how do you bring that back um, in a way, not, not the advertising, but how do you bring back the, the dollars you lost from advertising um, through readership? Uh, the challenge with that becomes that 
um, you know, as you are trying to figure that out, you are also disappointing some of your lo loyal readers, right? So, um, mm -hmm. you know, you are, you have a very traditional um, reader base that still subscribes to the newspaper and is the most um, loyal of all, but it is shrinking. And mm -hmm. so as you adjust uh, and as you look at different models that are focused more online, you are trying to balance how to bring in new engaged readers um, at, while, while not completely losing uh, the folks who had helped sustain you for all that time. Um, so, you know, I'm happy to talk more about that battle, but, you know, I moved to ProPublica about two years ago uh, and joined the local reporting initiative as an editor. That initiative is one in which ProPublica funds one reporter uh, from various local newsrooms for a year and works on an investigative project with them for that year. Um, and the editor collaborates with the local newsroom to help them uh, produce this series of investigative stories. I've now moved to become the editor who is in charge of an, an initiative between, between the Texas Tribune and ProPublica that will focus on bolstering investigative news in Texas. Um, and so that initiative has reporters in different parts of the state who all cover um, different areas um, and spend, you know, many of them are from Texas and have reported here and care deeply about the state. So, you know, that is one approach that we have taken to say, you know, we are funding local newsrooms and trying to help in that direction. But now we are also expanding to create uh, newsrooms that will, in this case, cover taxes um, and in other cases cover regions, right? So we are expanding to create a Southwest region and a South region, um, but all of those things are not going to help the solution of who is covering your mm. local city council and who mm. is covering, you know, education board races. And so it is one mm -hmm. thing that I think we all have to think about what piece of the pie we we kind of take. Just real quick follow up. Um, can you, there are some big and, and uh, good newspapers still in Texas, uh, Dallas Morning News, the San Antonio paper, Houston Chronicle, uh, a lot of really Austin, the Austin and the American Statesman. The, uh, how do you fit with those uh, those newspapers, which still have significant resource, or uh, uh, maybe not compared to what they used to be, but still have some resources? Yeah, I mean, I think all of those, and and I grew up reading the Dallas Morning News and still subscribe personally to many of those papers. Um, I. I think that we fit in in a way that we help augment the investigative reporting. I mean, every newsroom is dwindling in the state. They are still great uh, newsrooms that have really great reporters and really great editors, but they are getting smaller. Um, and so this is to add to, you know, the investigative heft that those mm -hmm. newsrooms bring. But it's also to say, you know, as you have seen um, those newsrooms shrink, a lot of them are much more focused on regional investigations, which means that, you know, large swaths of the state no longer mm. have that investigative muscle, right? Mm. And so, you know, I'm from the border. We don't have a strong investigative um, newsroom along the border. Uh, mm. We have folks who do really hard work but they don't have the time to invest in covering those things. You don't yeah. have the same in rural taxes. And so, you know, vast areas are going uncovered um, and we hope that this helps augment that. Got it, that's, that's great. Um, uh, Mandy, can I jump to you next? Um, you, you've basically uh, been running two different startups, uh, one in Northeastern Ohio, the other in Colorado. The Ohio project began, as I understand it, after the closure of the Vindicator in Youngstown, uh, a newspaper with a 150 year history in August of 2019. And uh, something called Mahoning Matters uh, um, emerged out of that. Can you tell us about the genesis of that project and the other project? 
projects that you're working on in, in Colorado and, and what you're trying to do in those communities? Yeah, sure. So yeah, as you said, uh, we started Mahoning Matters. It actually launched in the beginning of October of 2019 and the newspaper, The Vindicator closed on August 31st. So it was a pretty short turnaround to try to make sure that we could continue on some of what they were doing there. And um, you know, a big part of that also was, was bringing in the staff. So actually the entire editorial staff of Mahoning Matters came over from The Vindicator, people who've been covering the area, lived in the area a long time, you know, know a lot of the players there, which uh, we learned was really critical in trying to get this site up and running. Um, you know, when we got into the Compass experiment, um, it was to try to not only go in and, and serve communities that have limited sources of local independent news, but also to try to do this in a way that is going to be sustainable so that these news it's so that we could actually teach some lessons and, and prove some examples for others who wanted to go and start news outlets like this. Maybe just a quick educational. Uh, uh, just a quick uh, um, rewind. Can you explain the Compass experiment? Because it's very interesting uh, with Google and McClatchy. Right. Yeah. So um, this was a collaboration between Google and McClatchy where um, our sites are owned and operated by McClatchy. I'm a McClatchy employee. Um, but a lot of funding and I'd say really hands-on collaboration from people at Google at their um, Google News Initiative Local Experiments Project, which is entirely focused on building sustainable news sites and lessons for the rest of the industry in doing that. And we were the first sites to be in such a, an arrangement with Google, though there are, there are others now. And it's, it's the funding stream is how long? Three years, I think you said? Yeah. Yeah, that was okay. and that was from um, March of 2019, which was when that project really kicked off. And and I didn't um, uh, talk about the the Colorado in Longmont, Colorado. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah, it was interesting, especially when you add in the timing of COVID. That you know we launched Mahoning Matters in October, and then COVID was coming around in like February, March, and that had to change a lot of things uh, for, for everyone. And then um, we launched in Longmont, Colorado in May of last year. And so that's right in the middle of COVID, um, getting another site going in a very different community uh, with very different news needs, uh, but also trying to do this in a way that could work around COVID and around what was going on in the community, not only in how we relate to readers, but also you know, how you go out and meet with potential advertisers and potential partners. and and the staff, which I still have not met many of them in person because it's been COVID since then. So you know, we've always been a remote newsroom, but that takes it to the extreme when even your local teams can't meet with each other and I can't meet with them. Is the community, so M M Mahoning Matters serves Mahoning County and the Vindicator was the big newspaper in the county. Um, I don't know if there's other uh, new news outlets in there in the area. And what about in this Colorado community that you're in? Yeah, the needs were pretty different in each place. Um, the Vindicator covered about a five county region. Um, you know, it was known as a Youngstown paper, but you know, this is a big area, um, north northeastern Ohio, as well as a little bit of western Pennsylvania was in their coverage area. We knew we could not nearly do as much. Uh, but we did want to continue that regional approach because there's lots of these unincorporated townships and cities. So we knew we needed to try to factor that in. So that's a bit more regional. We cover primarily Mahoning County, but also a little bit of Trumbull and Columbiana counties there. Whereas in Longmont and Colorado, we're just covering the city of Longmont. Um, it's a city of just under 100,000 population. Uh, it does have a daily newspaper, but like many places, it's, it's a newspaper that, that's dwindling and has its own problems with resourcing. So we feel that there's always more need for news there, as opposed to Youngstown, where there is a newspaper the next county over. Um, they've been doing a little bit of coverage, but really the biggest uh, factor in Youngstown is that there are television stations. And that has been where we've tried to balance our coverage against you know, what is additive to this market and not just trying to do what TV is doing. Whereas in Longmont, we're like, we kind of have to try to do that everything to everyone because it is a lot more of a general interest news site. Um, finally, Sewell, uh, let's talk about the LA Times, which you joined in 2018 as the deputy managing editor for news. Soon after Patrick Soon Chang, a 
South African billionaire uh, purchased the newspaper. Um, I started my journalism career at the LA Times in 1998. And when it was still, I think, uh, considered one of the great newspapers in the country. Um, and it's been sad to watch the decline over the last couple of decades and really exciting to see some glimmers of this resurrection. Uh, is the LA Times still on the precipice? Uh, well, that's a great question, and, and thanks, Mike, for, for getting right to it. Um, I think there's no doubt that, you know, legacy news organizations are really continue to face strong economic headwinds. Um, as Zahira, you know, mentioned, you know, print advertising continues to decline. And the good news, of course, is that digital circulation is growing. Um, and it's been very exciting to see in the past decade a whole bunch of regional and local news organizations really assert that doing journalism that's worth paying for really, really matters. And that, you know, developing a, a loyal, large base of digital subscribers really matters. And, um, you know, we have over 250,000 digital only subscribers currently. Uh, of course, that's a tiny fraction compared to national news organizations like mm -hmm. uh, the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. But uh, given that we're a regional news organization, we're, we're very, very happy in that figure. You know, we're, um, uh, you know, we've, we've been given a lifeline and I think the LA Times is, should really best be seen as being in a category with other regional news organizations, including the Minneapolis Star Tribune and the Boston Globe, where, you know, that used to be part of chains and now are really kind of locally owned and controlled. I'd also put in that category, the Philadelphia Inquirer and the Salt Lake Tribune, two regional news organizations where local benefactors came together and converted these uh, uh, legacy news organizations into nonprofits uh, so that they could better serve the community. Um, that you mentioned 250,000 digital subscribers now. Uh, how, uh, give me a sense of like the, the growth in that. Like what was the number like when you started in 2018? Yeah, so, well, it's more than doubled. Uh, uh, definitely more than doubled, if not, if not even more since I uh, joined in the fall of 2018. I attribute that to uh, several things. Um, first of all, as part of the former Tribune Publishing Company, you know, our digital fortunes were really tied up with this larger chain that was headquartered in Chicago and included newspapers in Connecticut, uh, uh, Maryland, um, and also in North Carolina and elsewhere. And we're really, you know, coming into our own as an independent digital organization that required standing up not only our own technology teams of technologists, but also data scientists and engineers and a strong audience engagement team, a uh, lot more uh, engineers and developers and digital designers, the folks you need to really have kind of an independent digital operation. So that took quite a bit of time. Uh, also, of course, we had to transition to a new content management system that took time as well. But now that some of those infrastructure investments have been uh, made, we've really seen very substantial digital circulation growth, especially in 2020. And in my, to my mind, that really um, shows the value of a California-centered, California-obsessed publication, which is what I would like to see the LA Times become and which is what I'm steering our opinion team toward. Just quickly, uh, um, how bad did it get at the LA Times? Well, uh, there are many ways of measuring that. I think the, uh, the you know, um, I wanna first note that the LA Times has never stopped doing high quality independent journalism. When you consider especially the cutbacks that occurred here, really for a decade long period from let's say the great recession all the way through 2017, it is kind of remarkable that the, my colleagues, the journalists here continue doing so much brave, impactful work. Pulitzer Prize for investigation uh, into the city of Bell, uh, a kind of uh, lower income community, one of 88 cities in LA County, um, a lot of other really, really great work. And you know that was in spite of a lot of uh, obstacles and headwinds. So I don't think the independent journalism uh, mission ever went away. I do think that you know this place suffered a lot of cutbacks. It went from being a newsroom of over a thousand people to fewer than 400 uh, by 2018 when the paper was uh, uh, so uh, we had five transitions basically in the space of two years, a new owner, new management, uh, a new headquarters, or uh, you know, from moving from downtown LA to El Segundo near LAX airport, a new labor union. Uh, and I was proud to be part of the uh, negotiating team that reached our first ever collective bargaining agreement with our journalists. And then finally, we hope a new narrative, you know, a real, uh, a new narrative of, of, you know, the LA Times and what it can be and who, who it exists to serve. So, you know, we went, we've gone from having fewer than 400 journalists to more than 500 now, 
which is an incredible investment and not something we take for granted at a time when there remain so many cutbacks. Um, that's uh, very heartening. Um, M Marty Barron, I, uh, the executive editor of the Washington Post, uh, uh, who just announced that he's retiring, uh, wrote in his farewell note to his staff, the practice of quality journalism requires a sustainable business and the reverse is equally true. There can be no business without journalism of the highest caliber that the public values and will support. I actually thought that that those two statements were worth uh, examining a little bit further uh, with each of you all. Um, um, first of all, let's let's talk about whether local news can be a sustainable business. Uh, some you you all have already uh, alluded to some of the big structural forces that have uh, brought us to this point of the plummeting print circulation. The uh, no one's mentioned the implosion of classified advertising. Uh, from Craigslist, uh, the domination of digital advertising by Facebook and Google. Um, Mandy, can I come back to you and 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 ask you um, because you really are your your title is general manager, uh, and uh, and it, it's it's fascinating talking to you uh, um, as a journalist who's who's really have to has to think like a business leader. Um, and uh, I, I would love to hear some of the details of what you've learned about creating a sustainable business model for local news in the middle of a pandemic. I'd like to tell you I have this all figured out and that we can just, you know, replicate this all over the country. But, um, you know, as you guys know, it's really difficult to build something like this. And um, I'm often working with publications, you know, as part of McClatchy that have been around for a couple of hundred years. And so talking with them, it's a very different struggle when you have a very new publication, but it's also good because you don't have a lot of the old baggage either. I don't have to worry about digital classifieds. I don't have to worry about a collapse of print because that is not something that we've had to deal with. Um, but sustainability is incredibly difficult. You know, it's one thing to be able to hire a great staff and do great news. But in order to do that, especially from the beginnings, you know, we've got to create and grow these new news brands. Uh, we have to gain the trust of local audience and local sources. Uh, and, and as part of that, also getting out there and meeting local businesses, potential donors, um, and doing all of that in a very short order with a staff of about six. You know, that's how many people we're working with there. And that all of that has to happen at the same time and needs to be ramped up uh, over time. And, you know, a few things that we learned in this, um, for one, I would say uh, the importance of being local in this and, and making sure people know that has been key. So hiring the local team in editorial and in sales, people who can leverage their relationships and their experiences um, was really critical in getting things off the ground there. And, and really involving the audience as well. I think that that goes for every kind of publication when we're talking about sustainability. You know, for us, that was doing a lot of audience research upfront as we're putting together these publications of what's the community's needs, what are their user habits right now, what are the, the gaps in the market in terms of the competition and, and what we can do that is special and, and hopefully what people will pay for at some point down the road. Um, and then, you know, I think the same thing with relationships on the business side of what are the needs of these businesses that's not currently being served and what is something that we can do that is different in there. And so for us, that meant really not a lot of reliance on programmatic ads, which is the easy thing to do when you get in and start a startup business. You know, we have a few, but like that is not a huge part of our business. It's direct sold sponsorships with local businesses, which take a long time to get over the line and it's a lot of handholding, but it's, it's relationship based and that's a real investment. And that's a, you know, both a sign of a kind of a long-term relationship, just like it would be with advertising or a sponsorship, but it's also a sign of, you know, how we're working together with people in the community. What's the most promising revenue stream for you all in the two different sites or is it different? Uh, right now, I think it's still very much in um, giving is what we call it, which is something we actually mm. only launched during the pandemic. Both of our sites are for profit. 
So we had to really pivot on the fly as we're trying to get these sites up and running. Local businesses are struggling. Uh, so we simultaneously launched a giving program for readers. So I won't quite call it membership yet. I, we mm -hmm. want to turn it into that, but bringing our readers in on, hey, this is how we're funded. If you like what you're reading, please give to us on a one-time or a monthly basis. And, and that has gone really well for us. I mean, really better than expected, especially in Youngstown where the, there's not really a history of that. Um, and we've been really encouraged by that as well as working with local foundations and local funders who have not traditionally given to news. And we've done that through a fiscal sponsorship um, with the McClatchy Journalism Institute, who essentially makes it so that we can collect those funds and those funds can be given locally on a tax deductible basis, um, which we're ju we just kind of got through that at the end of the year. But I think those things have been especially helpful for us as we're um, you know, starting to get up and running and making this kind of revenue pie of knowing we can't have any one thing that we're gonna rely mm -hmm. on. It's gonna have to be several income mm -hmm. streams. I wanna talk about philanthropy a bit more later and talk about nonprofit uh, journalism in, in a bit, but um, let's stay on the sort of sustainable um, business model idea. And um, um, so, you, you have the luxury at the LA Times of having an owner with deep pockets and hopefully some patience. Um, um, and the 250,000 uh, digital subscriptions uh, sounds promising. I'm actually not sure what price point that is. And uh, uh, it, what's the, what is the biggest, uh, challenge for the for the LA Times to uh, to be able to sustain its newsroom on its own. Yeah, I and actually I'm you know I'm glad you mentioned having a benevolent owner. It certainly helps. But um, to quote uh, Laureen Jobs, who was recently <laughs> profiled, um, uh, a, bil a billionaire is not a business model. And I actually think that's right. There's a lot of discussion right now in local news about business models, about ownership structure, about you know nonprofit versus for profit. But the truth is that sometimes these distinctions are mean less in reality than they do on paper, right? Uh, uh, we're a money losing operation. Uh, I don't think that's a secret. And uh, I think getting us to the point of break even or sustainability is really, really important. And that's what our owner has emphasized that he's not seeking for this to be a profitable enterprise. Um, he himself has said he probably overpaid for it, but he did so because he was trying not to uh, uh, get revenue from this organization, but to give back to a city and a region that had given so much to him. And I think that kind of mission really, really motivates folks. I'm really struck listening to Mandy and others, um, how much there's a convergence right now in the desire to make local news work. Uh, we were very privileged at the LA Times to be part of Table Stakes, which is a um, multi-stakeholder initiative organized by the American Press Institute and the Lenfest Institute. And they're really helping local news organizations. And again, they don't care about uh, you know, your ownership structure. They care about making local news sustainable, whether you're nonprofit, chain, legacy, uh, um, independently owned. And we learned so much from the table stakes process mm -hmm. about understanding your audience better, serving segmented audiences in the ways that they need to be served, putting their information needs first. And I really think that that table stakes um, framework has been really, really helpful um, for us in thinking about these challenges. And I'm heartened at how much, you know, you go to these conferences, um, you know, including, uh, including, you know, the ones organized by, um, uh, there are some sponsored by Google and Facebook, because there's been a lot more attention to local news, we can discuss the social media giants in a moment, maybe, maybe. but there's, there's, you, you see kind of the same um, uh, players in the sense that we're all, we all recognize right now that this is an all in moment for our democracy. And I really think that we need to tie in the lo local news's survivability and sustainability into that larger project of supporting our democracy. It's not a surprise to me, sadly, that our democracy eroded at a time when we lost so much local news, when so many news deserts emerged all across America, when people are only getting their news from national news sources or only from, you know, whether Fox or CNN or only from television, you know, they're not, you have a whole spectrum of trust 
that has been eroded because trust, in my view, comes from comes from below. It comes from understanding the issues in your community. It comes from understanding your efficacy as a voter and as a participant in democracy. So really, we, it, if, to the extent over the last couple of decades, local news has eroded. I think that's been a big part of our uh, democratic woes. Um, maybe that's a good transition because I wanted to actually look at the second part of what Marty Barron said, which is which he said there can be no business without journalism of the highest caliber that the public values and will support. And and I, I was actually wondering if that really is true. I think he's referring to kind of this public service accountability journalism, and I think that has been borne out at the New York Times and. The Washington Post and um, uh, in during the Trump era at the New Yorker, I think we've we've benefited from some some of this in terms of doing journalism that people are willing to pay for. But I, I wondered if it's actually true at the local level. And and Zahir, I, I actually wonder. The whole point of your project is that I, I think that the um, public service journalism that they're isn't really a sustainable business model for, and, and therefore it needs um, some other options like n like a, a nonprofit like ProPublica or Texas Tribune to, to bolster that. Is that what no. you've seen? No, necessarily. I mean, you know, when I was, when I was in El Paso, um, you know, we did kind of what Sewell talked about. We did an analysis. We were also part of the program he talked about. We did an analysis of our audience and who um, and what people were reading. And often what we found was that it was, and this is different in every market, but often what we found was that people really flocked to the accountability journalism. Um, I think it's just hard for local newsrooms that are quite small and on a daily publication schedule to find the time to um, produce that on a consistent basis. And so I think what we did at ProPublica is we tried to ease that some, right? Because we know that this is something that folks flock to. We know that people really care about accountability investigative journalism. And we've seen it in the local newsrooms that we have worked with. Um, it has been striking the amount of impact that has happened, the readership that has come. We have news organizations that have put that work behind a paywall for themselves and have seen much higher conversion rates from that. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's just, it, it becomes a difficult um, balance, you know, and we've seen this, you know, Sewell mentioned Salt Lake earlier, Salt Lake City, and, you know, we've seen, um, you know, that's now a city where it's two newsrooms have decided to go to a weekly print publication so that they could, you know, focus more in other areas. And I think you're going to have to start seeing more difficult decisions like that. I mean, but I also think we often talk about newspapers and I'm from a newspaper, so I talk a lot about newspapers, but mm -hmm. there are lots of different models um, that have shown us that there is a path, right? We have seen public radio really step up in a way that has um, really brought local news to the forefront again. We have seen kind of nonprofit models, smaller nonprofit models come up um, and do those kind of deeper accountability um, narratives that have really resonated with communities. So, I mean, I think there is a sustainable model for that. I think that is one in which when we talk about loyal readers, loyal readers come back because they feel like you're giving them news that they can't get anywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I am a strong believer that that's accountability journalism, mm -hmm. um, but it, it takes a big shift when you have, you know, a very, when your model has been much different. Mm -hmm. um, so it really does take saying, we're gonna stop doing these things. And mm -hmm. in some cases that's easy. Like I remember, you know, we were covering, when I was younger, we were covering ribbon cuttings and things that nobody cared about. Um, Mandy, um, I, I, I would love for your perspective on this conversation. Cause you, uh, tell me again, the number of people in the newsroom in, in Mahoning Matters and uh, at Longmont. How many reporters did you say? Uh, we have two reporters in Longmont and uh, three 
counting an RFA reporter in Mahoney. RFA report, uh, stands report for, for America. Report for America. Well, she's uh, just out of college, so I won't I won't disparage her by saying that maybe she's a half reporter just because she's still <laughs> still getting her her feet under her. But we we count it. So so uh, I'm just fascinated by this challenge because um, uh, you're I I think I've been sort of taught that. You're trying to build a daily habit with readers. Uh, you're trying to bring them back again and again, uh, whether that's through a, a newsletter, a, a homepage. And, um, and if you're busy trying to produce things to get people to come back every day, how do you have time and space to do that accountability journalism that you can't get anywhere else? And I'm, I'm curious, Mandy, how you've encountered that balance that um, that struggled as a hero talked about of what to do and what not to do, what to stop doing. Right, right. And I, I think that is one of the biggest challenges, especially when you're working in local, uh, that, you know, we have to have a daily product that there is that that is what people need and, and, and what and their needs are going to be different. You know, they might want the daily police report. They want to know why the water main, what, what happened with the water main on Main Street yesterday. Uh, but at the same time, people like, well, what's really going on with city council? And what's this really about? And who's funding that? It's like, well, I've got two reporters. We've only got so much we can divide up here. And I think that that is a daily push-pull that we have to work with. Um, it's been a lesson we've learned over time in Mahoning, you know, because we do have local TV. So we intentionally kind of avoid crime traffic mm. weather because they've got that and that's that's their mm. wheelhouse and been able to do more of that accountability and service journalism there because that's what people expect but then covid comes around the need of like rapidly changing information that affects everything you know becomes accountability and service reporting and that's a, that made it so that we had to really change our reporting metabolism and what we covered to make it um, responsive to what the audience needed and you know that has been really difficult to sustain. And now we have to look at what is a second year of trying to do that look like in the long run. Um, and you know we see a similar thing in Longmont where it's a lot more general interest news. We have to do a lot more of those daily things. And I would say we do suffer for having less accountability or anything investigative wise. I mean, it's still only you know a nine month old site. But you know people want exclusive news. They want something they can't get anywhere else. But at the same time, we have to return the daily coverage. And it's a, it's frustrating to serve readers to know that they mm -hmm. want more. Um, but it's also frustrating from a funding standpoint that especially when you look at philanthropic funders or foundations, you know, they want to see like, where's your really innovative, new fancy thing that you're doing? And where's your video journalism? And where's your mm -hmm. data visualizations? I'm like, I don't have any of that. <laughs> And I'm not going to have any of that anytime soon because like I have to have someone at city council and school board today and that's mm -hmm. my two reporters. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're, it's just a struggle to keep mm -hmm. that daily habit built mm -hmm. and find out what needs to continue to be that and, you know, tweaking that over time through audience research, through watching the analytics, through mm -hmm. seeing what else is reported out there. Uh, to know like what what do we have to really focus mm -hmm. in on because we have to choose, you know, there's mm -hmm. going to be things that we'll see, you know, that hasn't worked, we're gonna to have to stop doing that or do that less often. And I'm sorry mm -hmm. to the 50 readers who really liked that feature, but mm -hmm. we can't keep doing it. Um, just quickly, is there, um, trying to keep up with all of that, is there a, a, a piece of journalism that you are really proud of that uh, came out of uh, um, um, either of those two sites? That, that That's an example of, uh, of something that is doable, even with such limited resources? You know, I think that the, the pandemic reporting at both sites has just been great. And, and that's because like, in some cases, we just have had to say, we're throwing everything else out today, especially early on, and especially now that the vaccine's coming out too. It's a new wave of kind of coverage and questions that are coming in from our readers. And that I think is what I've been most proud of our teams for is finding those ways to get those questions in, to answer those, to constantly update that, you know, uh, whether that's been having Q and A's on the site, just through the coverage of, of what's happening, what's opening, what's not opening. Uh, but also just for instance, just last night, 
uh, Mahoning Matters had a live uh, Zoom event with lots of local public health officials where we're just taking questions virtually from the audience on Zoom. And it went, I think it went over by like 40 minutes just because there were so many questions. And being able to be a venue for that, I think that that has been uh, exactly where our wheelhouse is, where you're providing that value, um, but you know, also doing it in a way that, that shows what our priorities are. That, that's fantastic. Um, I, I wonder uh, if we can talk about nonprofit journalism. Um, uh, ben Smith, uh, uh, the media columnist for the New York Times, wrote a column, provocative column, deliberately provocative, I think, uh, saying that um, you should just scrap the 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 um, um, big newspaper companies and and the chains and and uh, just plow money into nonprofits. Um, in nonprofit journalism. Um, the thing that I've struggled with is like, how, how do you scale uh, not nonprofit journalism? And um, so I, I wonder if, uh, I think you all will have thoughts on this, but um, maybe Zahira, if you could start um, as someone who has been, uh, you know, at ProPublica uh, on the ground with this and, and with the local reporting network and now your new project in Texas, um, what are the uh, limits of nonprofit journalism as you've seen them? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, I think we have seen a lot of success, um, you know, both at the Texas Tribune and at ProPublica with um, being able to draw the, the donors and the attention to the work. Um, I think there are some challenges at a local level with nonprofit models. Um, I think it is hard, it is e much easier um, to get um, donors at a national level, mm. even who care about local news, than it is to get enough donors to fund, um, you know, a very local initiative mm. who, you know, from within a community. Um, so I think, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go back to El Paso on this. El Paso just started a nonprofit online news organization called mm -hmm. El Paso Matters. Um, and I think most of their funding at the moment comes from a national level. Uh, and so I do think that you have to find a way to, you know, one, balance, you know, where the money is coming from. You know, Mandy talked a lot about kind of having a membership base and, and, and finding that membership base that can help sustain a local nonprofit while at the same time, you know, understanding what makes that community stand out to not just local donors, but national donors. Uh, because I do think that has become the, the biggest issue for folks who I've talked to who are running local nonprofits. It's how do we get enough folks to participate and fund mm -hmm this important journalism mm -hmm. um and part of it is how do we get enough folks to care about this community in that way mm -hmm. and understand why it's so important mm -hmm. um so i think that's one of the biggest challenges that i've seen but mm -hmm. you know i'm sure mandy uh also has some some interesting thoughts around that yeah mandy i'd love to you mentioned that you uh i think covid drove you to do some th things that you weren't necessarily expecting to do right away including pursuing philanthropy. And I think you mentioned some local foundations, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, do you relate to what Zahira said about how it's hard to get funding for specifically local initiatives like that? Oh, definitely. I mean, I think we've been really fortunate with the local foundations that we had in Youngstown who were, I think, trying to look at ways to respond to COVID, especially from a public health basis. And Kind of convincing them hey like we are one of those outlets but like what does that look like going forward i, I don't really know because that was that right. was last year you know what is next year and mm. and this is just in youngstown which is its own you know economically depressed area there's only so mm -hmm. much to work with and i think it's it's simplistic to think about nonprofit as a as a solution um mm -hmm. i mean i think nonprofits are great but it's not a business model and mm -hmm. it is, it's just a tax status. And, you know, mm -hmm. for us, that means, hey, we're for profit, but we, the things that we do to operate like a nonprofit 
are what's actually drawing in funding, about being transparent about our decision-making, being upfront about our mission, how we fulfill that mission. Uh, I think everyone could be doing that. You don't have to be a nonprofit to do it. And I think mm -hmm. that one of the biggest struggles is not only are there enough local donors to mm -hmm. support this, whether that's foundations or, or just people with money to do so in the community, but mm -hmm. I think that that's also a matter of, of the scale that you mentioned of, you know, one of the biggest challenges we've had is it's really expensive to run a local news site. There's so much overhead that if you're not part of a network, if you're not mm -hmm. part of some group that already has how you've mm -hmm. built your website, how you serve your ads, your mm -hmm. HR functions, all of, all of these things that go into the back end of it, they're really mm -hmm. difficult to do on your own. And, you know, we've been trying to do that for, uh, you know, a little over a year with both of our sites of trying to form them on their own. And that's mm -hmm. been one of the most difficult parts is that mm -hmm. vendors that serve newsrooms are not built for newsrooms that size. The mm -hmm. bills aren't built for newsrooms that size. Mm -hmm. And that there needs to be solutions that are not just saying, well, we'll have a rich person and we'll have a nonprofit and they can go build themselves a WordPress site and it'll all be fine. That is mm -hmm. not a long-term solution. Um. Mandy, I, I maybe quickly, um, maybe that's a good point to, to mention that um, you're transitioning out of the Compass experiment right now. And um, what's the future of the Compass experiment? Well, it was very much taking off on that idea of what we've learned about some of the difficulties of not being part of a network. So our two sites are actually gonna go become parts of networks and not be independent like they are right now anymore. So uh, Mahoning Matters is gonna become one of McClatchy's newsrooms. I know that sounds weird to say, but they're actually gonna be joining the news division and working uh, more in tandem with that instead of completely independently as it has been. And the Longmont Leader is actually gonna be sold to one of our partners who, who we helped set up the site with. So they're gonna be spinning off with them and. And really, I think it's going to be an interesting kind of next step of the test to see how this works for these sites to be part of networks and continue to be able to operate with the, the local teams and the local focus that they have, but probably getting more support than it would be if you're going out and trying to do this all from scratch. And I'll be leaving at the end of the month. I'm just getting these, uh, get it, getting my uh, nestlings ready to fly. Uh, we hope they do fly. Um, I think we're nearing the end, and and I wonder if we uh, can get a little bit uh, abstract, uh, bigger picture, and 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 talk about some of the big ideas that have been thrown out there in the conversations about <coughs> local news. Um, do, do you all? Uh, uh, have I, thoughts and ideas uh, as, as practitioners of local journalism about what is uh, might, might be a big solution. What about this idea that's been thrown out about a public subsidy for journalism? Something uh, uh, like what exists for the BBC um, to a lesser extent, NPR and PBS get some, some government funding. Um, perhaps big tech companies might contribute to this subsidy. Um, it, what, what do you all think of those kinds of ideas or others? So I don't know if you have want to jump in. Um, yeah, let me, uh, I'll start. I mean, this could be its own, its own hour, but I'll start with a few. First of all, I don't think there's one solution. This is too big a problem for there to be one solution. And just as this is an all in moment for our democracy, it's an all in moment for news and understanding that local news is a public good is the kind of first thing we have to all agree on before we can get any policy solutions. I'd bring up, bring up a few. Um, countries like Australia and France and Canada are moving to get the social media giants to pay, you know, my kind of essentially micropayments for the news that they circulate uh, and, and then get uh, a profit off of, but, but currently don't pay for it. I don't know how that would fix in, fit into the existing regulatory framework in the US, but I think it's a very interesting idea. There are legislative proposals, bipartisan ones, to um, allow a, a tax deduction for local news subscriptions. I think that's a fascinating idea. It's one that doesn't require giant public investment, and it signifies, again, that local news is a public good. 
I'm more um, skeptical about the idea of direct public subsidy. I think there are models that where it could work. New Jersey has an interesting statewide initiative. Um, it, it's, it could be a very, very important way to kind of replant or, or help out the news deserts that have emerged in America. But of course, given the First Amendment and our own constitutional framework and our lack of tradition uh, around kind of government subsidy of news outside of, say, Voice of America or Corporation for Public Broadcasting, that might be hard policy-wise, but I'm certainly open to it. Uh, Man, here's a hero. Do you have the big solution? I, I was just going to say, I, I think we all wish we had the big solution. Um, and it's just not that simple. And it is something that requires, I mean, Sewell said it all nicely and talked about some of the bigger thoughts around it. Um, but, you know, anything that relies on just one solution is bound to fail. And so I think it has to be a, you know, we really have to look at how do you support and sustain local news in you know how do you diversify the support uh for local news in a way that if one crashes you know uh you still have a strong system you know we talk about this you know in texas we talk about this with oil and gas all the time right how much do you rely on oil and gas to prop up an economy um and and so i think it's the same with local news it has to be you know it has to be a um broad approach that that you know hits at different issues and and helps it become longer term. Yeah, and Mandy. I would add to. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go <laughs> so ahead. Just, um, and I think that Sewell really you know nailed it. You know, with like the, all these various options, and it's going to be lots of small options. And I would also say that the future of local news is lots of small publications. That I think that is a part of the conversation that the industry doesn't want to have because it's difficult that there is a there are a lot of publications that haven't made it there's a lot more that aren't going to make it uh, and it's not great we don't like that that's happening we don't like that people are out of work but I think that the future of news could also be lots of entrepreneurs lots of people who live in their areas some of these journalists who might have come from local newspapers in the past of starting something up that doesn't take a lot of sustainability or that maybe over time can become something bigger. But we have to change your idea about what local news looks like too and, and change the audience's idea of that because you know, lots of small seeds also really matter uh, in terms of being, to make sure that, being able to make sure we can cover local communities and do so in a sustainable way. Well, I think that's our time. Uh, thank you all. I'm just uh, incredibly, uh, I feel incredibly privileged to be in your company and proud to call you all co-workers in this uh, effort uh, for uh, democracy, really. And uh, I thought this was a really useful, interesting conversation. And hopefully uh, somebody out there watching, uh, it will spur uh, action and uh, new ideas and new solutions. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Thanks Michael. Thank you, man. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.